Hi guys, today we'll delve into the case of a girl who disappeared from her bedroom in the middle of the night. Her sister, who shared the bed with her, told her something very strange, that a person in a wizard hat took her. This case remained unsolved for a whopping 35 years, but in 2024, the truth finally came to light. Jessica Gutierrez was born on December 3, 1981, in South Carolina. She was the youngest in her family, with two sisters and a brother. Shortly after her birth, Jessica's parents divorced, leaving her mom, Debbie, to raise four children on her own. They all lived in a small town called Edmond, near the state capital. It was hard for Debbie to provide for all the children without any support. But despite this, the family were pretty close-knit. When Debbie was working, the older kids looked after Jessica, and when she had free time, Debbie tried to come up with something fun to do for all of them. On June 5th, 1986, their family was spending a typical summer day. Jessica, who was four at the time, was playing in the yard with her siblings while their mom finished up some jobs around the house. In the evening, they all had dinner together, and Debbie put the children to bed. Jessica usually slept with her mom on the same bed since she was the youngest, but on that particular day, her brother had an earache so Debbie decided to let him sleep with her. As a result, Jessica went to sleep with her older sisters. The eldest slept on a separate bed, and the other lay with Jessica. The next morning, Debbie woke up around 9 a.m. Six-year-old Rebecca, who slept in the same bed as Jessica, went into her mother's room and asked her to make cereal for breakfast. Debbie got out of bed, left her room, and immediately noticed that something was wrong. The front door, which she always locked before going to bed, was wide open, and their dog, who usually stayed outside, was running around the house. There was also a curtain rod laying under the back window, and the protective screen had been removed from it. Debbie went into the girl's room, but Jessica was nowhere to be found. She also noticed some papers scattered on the floor. When she asked her older daughters where their sister was, Rebecca replied, she's gone. A man with a beard and a magic hat took her. Thinking her six-year-old daughter was just joking, the mother went to look for Jessica. She thought maybe her daughter had gone out to play in the yard, but she wasn't there. Debbie searched the entire house, hoping Jessica was just playing hide and seek. But pretty soon, she realized that Jessica was not in the house. So the mother ran back to the girl's room and began demanding Rebecca to tell where her sister was. The girl kept repeating the same thing about the man in the magic hat, and Debbie started to lose her temper. She began shouting and asking why Rebecca hadn't screamed for help if someone was taking her younger sister from the house. After that, Rebecca finally told more details of what had happened. According to her, she woke up in the middle of the night and saw a man with a beard and in a wizard hat next to their bed. He gently picked up Jessica, who was still sleeping, and left the room with her. Rebecca, who was only six, didn't fully understand what was happening. She was scared and covered her head with a blanket, thinking it was just a weird dream. After lying like that for a while, she fell asleep and didn't even think to tell her mom what had happened in the morning. Realizing that Rebecca was likely telling the truth, Debbie immediately called the police. Officers searched the entire house and came to the conclusion that she could indeed have been abducted. Most likely, the perpetrator entered the house through the living room window by removing the protective screen. Upon closer inspection of the area, they discovered a fingerprint on the exterior of the glass and handed its image to experts. Next to the window, the police found a pack of cigarettes and several cigarette butts. Understanding that they were likely dealing with a kidnapping, investigators installed a recording device on Debbie's phone. This was done in case the kidnapper would call with a ransom demand. The police listened to Rebecca's account, and she told them the same story about the man in a wizard hat. This time, she added that he had unplugged the fan and nightlight before approaching their bed. The girl hadn't seen the kidnapper's face, so her description didn't offer any help to the investigators. They focused on Debbie and brought her to the station, where they asked her to recount all the events of the previous day in the utmost detail. During the conversation, she mentioned that she had a strong guess who might have taken her daughter. Just a few days before, she had ended a relationship with a man she had been dating for several months. According to Debbie, he was quite aggressive and controlling, and he also drank pretty often. The man wasn't happy with Debbie's decision to end their relationship. So, she thought he might have decided to take revenge by taking her daughter. She called him from the police station, but he denied any involvement in Jessica's disappearance. The police decided to investigate him further, but found no evidence linking him to the crime. They also checked Jessica's father, but
but he had long been living out of state and just couldn't have abducted his daughter. Meanwhile, experts ran the fingerprints found on the window through the FBI database, but there were no matches. The police decided to focus on search efforts and began combing the area around Jessica's house. It was located on the outskirts, with endless fields stretching for many miles around it. Police searched abandoned buildings, forests, streams, and rivers, as well as any other places where Jessica could potentially be. The next day, the FBI joined the investigation, but they still couldn't find any traces of the missing girl. Police started distributing flyers not only in nearby towns, but throughout the entire state. The sheriff also sent an airplane to survey the area from the air. The search continued for several days, and during this time, Debbie was restless. With three children to care for, she was unable to go out and search for her daughter. The police rarely spoke with her, only responding when she reached out to them herself. On Saturday, two days after Jessica's disappearance, Debbie decided to call the sheriff and ask whether they would continue the search over the weekend. She was understandably beside herself with grief, and the conversation became quite tense. Debbie accused the sheriff of negligence and lack of interest in finding Jessica. The sheriff responded that he had been searching for her daughter all night and warned that if she persisted in accusing him, he would call off his team and they would all simply forget about this case. Since Debbie's phone still recorded everything, she saved this recording. The woman continued to believe that the police were not doing enough to find her daughter, so she was losing more and more hope of finding Jessica alive with each passing day. This went on for several months, until there was a rather unexpected twist in the case. Ten weeks after Jessica's disappearance, the police faced a series of crimes. A local man had broken into someone's house, but the owner used a weapon to scare him off. Then, this man stole a van and drove to North Carolina, where he broke into a home of a sleeping woman and assaulted her. Shortly after this incident, the man was arrested and his fingerprints were entered into the database. Once they were there, investigators got a full match. His fingerprints matched those left on the window in Jessica's house. The man was a 27-year-old Thomas McDowell, and as soon as Debbie learned about this, she immediately told the police. She knew this person. She had met Thomas through relatives, and just a few months before Jessica's disappearance, she had hired him to do some work on their property. Over the course of two days spent at her house, he had built a shed and repaired the awning over the porch. Another curious fact was that Thomas had a beard and always wore a tall cowboy hat. This led to the thought that Rebecca, who only briefly saw the abductor in the darkness, might have mistaken this headgear for a wizard's hat, similar to those she'd seen in cartoons. But there was one huge problem for the investigators. Despite the fingerprint match, they deemed this evidence insufficient to press charges. They still didn't have Jessica's body, so they couldn't be 100% sure she was not alive. The presence of Thomas's fingerprints on the window could also have an explanation unrelated to the abduction. Since he worked on Debbie's property for two days, the fingerprint could have been left during that time. Although, such a possibility was quite unlikely. During the inspection of the house, forensic experts noted that the fingerprint appeared fresh. It hadn't been exposed to external factors, such as weather, which could have visually altered it. Debbie also regularly cleaned this window where the fingerprint was found. When her children played in the yard and wanted to say something to her, they would run up to this open window, lean on it with their hands, and shout. Given that the children's hands were almost always dirty, Debbie had to constantly clean the glass. Thomas had been working on her property around six months before the abduction, and there were no other fingerprints found there at the time of the investigation. This indicated that the man almost certainly could not have left the fingerprint back then, or else it would have been wiped out. Debbie also added another interesting fact. She remembered that when Thomas worked on her property, she accidentally locked herself out of the house, leaving the keys inside. As a result, she had to climb through the same window, and Thomas saw her doing it. But all these facts didn't convince the police. They continued to believe that there wasn't enough evidence against Thomas to press charges. In 1987, he was convicted of assaulting the woman whose home he broke into and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Debbie was shattered by the fact that the police refused to charge him with the abduction, but there was nothing she could do about it. That same year, something else happened. Thomas's cellmate contacted the police and told them that Thomas had confessed to him about committing the crime. According to Thomas, he abducted a girl in South Carolina from her own bedroom to assault her. While he was committing this horrible act, the victim bit him, and in a fit of rage, he killed her. Thomas dismembered the remains, took them to a field, and left them there. 
Investigators in Jessica's case went to prison to speak with him, and Thomas didn't even bother to deny it. Nevertheless, he said he was willing to confess if they provide him with full immunity. The authorities obviously couldn't agree to such terms, so the police once again came up empty-handed. Learning that Thomas had escaped punishment, his cellmate wrote a letter to Debbie and told her this story. Once again, she was shocked by the fact that Thomas was allowed to evade justice, but there was nothing she could do about it. Frustrated by the police's lack of action, Debbie decided to conduct her own investigation. At one point, she located an abandoned car that had previously belonged to Thomas and inspected it. There, on one of the seats, she noticed threads and fabric fibers that matched the color of Jessica's pajamas, the one she wore the night of her disappearance. But the police didn't rush to pursue this lead. The fact that Debbie, without any special equipment or knowledge of forensic science, found fabric particles in some car seems strange to them. In 1987, something else happened. Police from Kansas contacted local investigators and reported that they found a girl fitting Jessica's description. Her mother immediately flew there, but her hopes were instantly shattered. When she came to see the girl, just hearing her voice from the corridor was enough for her to realize it wasn't her daughter. Over the following years, Debbie gave several interviews where she accused the police of ignoring the obvious suspect, but it didn't yield any significant results. In 1990, Jessica's case was featured on a popular television program about unsolved crimes. This led to a new wave of tips, but unfortunately, they all turned out to be dead ends. A year later, Jessica became the first missing child of South Carolina for whom an age-progressed portrait was created. Considering it was the early 90s, such technology was quite new and experimental, but detectives hoped it could help identify Jessica all these years later. Unfortunately, despite all this, the case remained unsolved for many years. In 2007, 21 years after Jessica's disappearance, her mother once again publicly accused the local police department of inaction. This time, she gave reporters the recording of her conversation with the sheriff, where he told her he could call his men off and forget about this case. They reached out to the sheriff, but he stated that he hadn't stopped investigating the case all these years. The sheriff also said that after this conversation with Debbie, he not only didn't send his men home, but assigned even more officers to the investigation. Debbie also complained that for years, she had been trying to get other agencies involved in this case. But each time, the local prosecutor's office blocked these attempts. In the same year, 2007, they reviewed the case and confirmed that they didn't have any sufficient evidence making it impossible to press charges against anyone at that time. In 2014, the sheriff faced charges related to fraud and bribery, leading to his dismissal and a 12-month jail sentence. Two years later, the prosecutor was arrested for a hit and run while drunk, resulting in a $1,000 fine and his resignation. In 2021, after 35 years since Jessica's disappearance, the new sheriff named Jay Kuhn reopened the investigation with the FBI's help. 50 agents were assigned to this case, revisiting all available evidence and seeking new leads. Eventually, they not only concluded that there is enough evidence against Thomas McDowell, but also discovered new indirect pieces of evidence linking him to the crime. His relatives and friends revealed that the man drastically changed his appearance after Jessica's disappearance, shaving his beard and long hair and ditching his favorite cowboy hat. They also said that he smoked the same brand of cigarettes found near Jessica's home. Unfortunately, experts couldn't find any traces of DNA on these pieces of evidence, probably due to the fact that they've been tested multiple times in the past, which might have wiped out any biological traces. While all these factors added to suspicion against Thomas, the key evidence remained his fingerprint and the testimony of his former cellmate. Eventually, detectives believed that they had enough evidence to bring the case to trial, and in January 2022, Thomas was finally arrested. At 62 years old, Thomas refused to admit guilt, and preparation for the trial stretched for several years. It began only in January 2024, and Thomas's lawyers attempted to challenge the existing evidence. They argued that the fingerprint on the glass was left when Thomas had worked on the property. The defense also tried to use Rebecca's testimony. As we recall, Jessica's sister said that she saw a man in a wizard hat. Thomas's lawyers tried to convince everyone that the girl couldn't have mistaken a cowboy hat for a wizard's as they are completely different. However, experts brought in by the prosecution pointed out that the fingerprint was clearly fresh. If it had been left a few months before the abduction, it would have either been erased or altered by the weather. During the trial, a former inmate also testified, 
repeating Thomas's confession made in prison in 1987. The prosecution pointed out that an outsider from another state would unlikely know the details of the case. Moreover, in those years, Thomas himself said he was willing to confess, but asked for full immunity, which was obviously not an option. The trial ended on February 8th, and the jury unanimously found Thomas guilty. At 63 years old, he was sentenced to life in prison. For Debbie, who had been convinced of his guilt from the early years of the investigation, the outcome of this case stirred conflicting emotions. She was glad that the perpetrator was finally held accountable, but said that Thomas could have been arrested 36 years ago. Instead, the police allowed him to live a long life before facing justice. Debbie also still couldn't come to terms with the fact that her daughter's remains were never found all these years. She, along with the new sheriff, refuses to give up and will continue the search, but the chances of finding her daughter after almost four decades are quite low. Share your thoughts on this story in the comments section, and don't forget to press the like button if you enjoyed my video. Thank you for watching.